Hello everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Tonight's special guest that we have with us, we are always so grateful to have her with us, is uh, Patricia Peterson. She is a uh, Washington State University Master Gardener, and we are just so grateful um, to have her with us um, speaking on a really great topic, demystifying rain gardens. Thank you so much, Patricia. You're so welcome. I'm just delighted to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I kind of have to laugh. The very first time I ever did this presentation, it was about 98 degrees out. <laughs> and here we are talking about rain gardens. Um, today is a little bit different. We've got the kind of day where maybe we would want to think about rain gardens. So um, really, really pleased that you're all here. Um, I like to be a little bit informal because I know that if I don't ask a question or make my comment while the slide is up, I tend to forget about it. So if you would like to ask a question or that, please either just put your hand up or if there's a break, um, pop on in and ask your question or make your comment. And Marlene, if you would monitor the chat, that would be terrific. Definitely. Yeah. So let's take a look at this. Um, I don't know how familiar any of you might be with rain gardens. It's certainly an interest, interesting and popular topic these days. Um, it's an important topic. And as we go through this, we'll see why. And also uh, basically how to create one and why they're so important. So this is what Tacoma and the Puget Sound area and all of the rest of this area that we love so much looked like, oh, a little over 100 years ago. Um, and you, any of you that like hiking, probably can actually just even feel this under your feet looking at the picture. It's all kind of spongy. It's got that moss layer on top of it and that just lovely forest duff that's down there. Um, and the interesting thing about that kind of soil is that it's just like a sponge, the way it soaks up water, and it holds that, and it then very gradually releases that on down into the deeper soil, and the plants grow their roots very, very deeply so that they can take advantage of all of that water going down there. This is probably more what we're all used to seeing, and you know, all that concrete just doesn't feel very soft under your feet. And it also doesn't seem to absorb that water. Um, the water runs off and I think it's very easy for any of us to say, but what's the big deal? It makes it down to the bay and so everything is fine. Um, a couple of interesting points about that. Uh, once we're sending all that fresh water down to the bay, it's really hard for us to make good use of it again. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting about it, and I was reminded of this again just yesterday when I shared a video with a friend that I like so well. Um, it's done by the Nature Conservancy and WSU, and it talks about the plight of the coho salmon. And the coho salmon are dying at a great rate, as many of you probably are aware. And did some pretty interesting testing that showed that if they took stormwater runoff and fresh well water, and put baby coho in each, within 24 hours, 100% of the baby coho salmon were dead in the storm runoff, and 100% of the baby coho salmon were alive in the fresh well water. Um, so consequently, there have been a lot of tests that have gone on about all of that, trying to figure out why. They focused it down to um, the tire substance on the roads. And then it took them quite a lot longer to break that apart and find out what was the actual chemical in that tire substance that was killing the fish. But they have now identified it. And so now the question is, how do we get that out of our tires? Um, but that's a really interesting reason why even though all of this water may run eventually into the Puget Sound, it can do a lot of damage along the way. So what is a rain garden anyway? A rain garden is a way to capture stormwater runoff and get it back down into the aquifer like that forest used to. And the interesting thing about that is as the, the stormwater runoff goes through that ground, and in this case, it's a rain garden rather than the forest, 
it filters all those pollutants out. So they ran those tests again using water that had been filtered through a simple mixture of compost and sand. And 100% of the baby coho live in the stormwater runoff that had been filtered through the compost and the sand. Um, so a rain garden is really a good way to both recharge the aquifer, put a really beautiful new garden in your yard and take care of our baby coho all at the same time. So it's kind of hard to beat. So we'll go into this in a little bit more detail. Yes, cheers. <laughs> we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but basically it's a big depression in the ground. I like to say that it starts with depression, which we usually are when it's raining around here. Um, you build a depression. Their soil needs to be soil that drains well. And there's something called a compost mix, which is half or a um, rain garden mix, half compost, half sand. And if your soil doesn't drain well, you can amend it with that. Um, and the water from a surface, typically roofs and patios and driveways, are then run into the rain garden, which both waters the plant and filters the soil. And at the bottom, the base of the rain garden, are plants that are okay if water is standing there for about 24 hours. So if we've had a really heavy rain, it doesn't have to all soak through right away. It will just gradually filter down and on into the aquifer. Um, in this case, we typically recommend to use natives as much as possible. And the main reason for using natives is they require a whole lot less maintenance because they're pretty accustomed to our mechanisms for delivering water here in the Puget Sound area. And they also need virtually no fertilizer. So they're just pretty darn hardy. Questions about the basics of what a rain garden is? Alrighty. It's really a landscape area that collects, absorbs, and filters rainwater. Um, it's a depression. You need to add some different soil to it. The plants are chosen specifically for their ability to deal with the rainwater. And deep rooted plants are really, really good for it, as you can well imagine, because as that water rains down, one, um, percolates on down through the soil, then those deep rooted plants suck that up. Uh, we like natives because natives, both besides uh, filtering the water really well, uh, they don't require much maintenance. And the birds and the insects around here that do such a great job of pollinating really like them. And it reduces or eliminates runoff to the stormwater system. So it has a whole lot of benefit for a whole lot of reasons. I see a couple of things in chat. Let's see what's going on there. What questions might we have? Um, it does not have to be in the sun. And we will get into um, some of the, the different kinds of plants you'd use in the sun versus the shade in a few minutes. It's a terrific question. Um, so rain gardens do a lot. They increase your contribution to preserving clean water. Um, I think all of us know that it's just becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And around here at the Puget Sound area, because it's so gorgeous and so many people want to live here, we have more and more people coming in. And so that clean water becomes more and more critical. So it is collecting that rainwater. Um, I happen to live out on Fox Island and out here, all of our water comes from the aquifer. It all comes from wells. So if we're not recharging that aquifer, if we're not getting that rainwater back down into the ground, we could run out of drinking water. That would be a bad thing. Uh, we're not alone in that. A whole lot of the water systems that we have around here um, do come from um, um, the aquifer. Not all of them come from rivers and streams. A lot of them come from wells, and those wells are pulling that water from the aquifer. It also cleans that water on the way down so that we can use it and can drink it, which I just think is so cool. How do you run water through dirt and have it come out clean? Now think about that for a minute. <laughs> if I could figure that out with my dog, it would be really nice. <laughs> and, you know, quite frankly, it can provide a really beautiful garden area, depending on how it's designed. And you can design it to whatever your taste might be, which is nice. My page down button is not working. Hang on one second. Technical difficulties. There we go. 
So if you take a look at the picture on the left, um, you know, that's, that's one option. You can have that mucky, horrible water coming down and that poor heron looking at it like, I can't believe that is actually coming into their bay. Um, or up on the right are some examples of rain gardens found. Um, you can tell that you cannot look at the yard and say, oh my gosh, look, there's a rain garden. You just look at that yard and say, gosh, look at that lovely landscaping. I think that's a really important part to think about when you think about rain gardens. Um, some people have it in their head that it needs to look a specific way in order to be a rain garden, but it really doesn't. It can be a circle, it can be an oblong, it can be a kidney, it can be square, it can be linear, it can be anything you can make it. Starts with a depression, as I said before. <laughs> the size um, is depends on a number of different things. There are calculations that say, if you have this much water coming off your, if your roof is this big, you'll have this much water coming off. And so you need to drain this much. Um, they're really very simple calculations and there are guides out there that you can use to do them. Um, the size depends on how big the area you want to drain is, how well your soil drains, and quite frankly, how much space do you have for the rain garden. Um, and then you can make adjustments, you can either add more runoff to it if you have plenty of space or if you decide, you know, that water, there's a lot more water in there than I had anticipated, you might decide to shut off, you know, one gutter or something along those lines. They typically get the runoff from either the downspouts or any other hard surface that you have on your property, patios, parking, driveways, walkways. And again, designed to be a temporary pond where the water will, over the course of about 24 hours following a heavy rain, will percolate on down. And if your soil doesn't drain that well, we can always amend the soil. So in that case, what we would do is we would dig it deeper than it needs to be and replace the soil that was taken out, that clay-based soil that many of us have um, with some rain garden soil, which is half sand, half compost. Make sense? Pretty simple, huh? How do I design a rain garden? Again, these are all rain gardens and driving by, you just wouldn't say, my gosh, look at that rain garden. Um, there are some common things. You might notice that a couple of these on the bottom and the one on the middle left there have rock coming into them. That's a little bit like a dry creek bed. You can well imagine that over the course of a downpour that creek bed isn't quite so dry. Um, it is definitely built to be a creek bed that will funnel the water in. Another option to get the water in is what's called tight lining. You basically put a um, piece of PVC or, or hosing of some sort at the end of your downspout, and you can put it underground if you don't want to have something along the lines of a dry creek bed. So the one in the upper left that's all lawn is tight lined in. And at the very left-hand side, you can see a gathering of small rocks in that particular garden. And that would be the spot where that PVC comes in and brings the water into that rain garden. So you can really design it to be anything you'd like it to be. The one on the top right there looks like you're out in the mountains, quite frankly. That one is just a really lovely design if you have a large natural kind of landscape but you can do anything you'd like with it. Where do you put the darn thing? Where's the good place to put my rain garden? Well, it needs to be a place where the water can get to it by gravity. So a little bit downhill from where your gutters come out or your patio is would be ideal. And you can probably understand why you might want it 10 feet from your building because there's a lot of water that will stand in there periodically. And you don't really need a whole lot of water standing next to your foundation. That's pretty hard on them. We always call 811 before digging. Um, a lot of people think that if they have an area that doesn't drain well, they should turn that into a rain garden. And actually, that's a better candidate for a bog garden, which are different kinds of plants get. And that tends to be plants that like their toes wet constantly. So an area of poor drainage, you might really want to consider there's a phrase I like really well, if you can't fix it, feature it. So if you can't get it to drain, pick some really beautiful bog plants and just go with it, but not the best place for your rain garden. 
They also should keep them away from septic tanks, drain fields, and wells for some pretty obvious reasons. Again, we're back to that standing water concept. And so any area of your yard that's designed already to drain like a septic tank or a drain field, you don't wanna be adding additional water to that. That could change how it functions. And certainly near a well, again, you don't want standing water near where you're pulling well. And not on a steep hill, um, because again, standing water and steep hills don't go together well. And then you size it for how much runoff you've got, how well your soil drains, and how much available space you have. And there is a rain garden handbook that has been designed by the state of Washington that you can get, oops, excuse me, that you can get available online. Um, it's free and it has the calculations that you can use to figure out exactly how big your rain garden should be to take in all the water you'd like it to take in. Um, the link is pretty useless on the slide. I really clearly understand that. But if you do just a search on rain garden handbook, um, the link should come up for you and you can just click on it and it's a PDF that you can download. Or um, we can also send out that link if that's something that you would like to have as well. We can send that out specifically. Questions, thoughts, comments? Okay. How do you plan it? So now you've decided you want one. Now, how do you go about doing it? Um, the first thing is to check how well your soil drains. And those of us that live out here in the boonies um, are all on septic systems. And so we're pretty familiar with perk tests. But basically, it's just a really tiny, tiny kind of a little perk test. Instead of getting the back hoe out, you just get the shovel out and dig a hole and pour some water in there and see how long it takes. To drain. Um, and that will decide how much room do you need at the bottom of your rain garden to hold about 24 hours of really hard drain or really hard rainfall. What's that going to, how much depth do you need? Usually it's between about seven inches and a foot for most rain gardens. So all in all, they don't have to be really deep to work well. And then what kind of size and shape do you like as far as the rest of the landscaping around your home might go? Um, that again gets to, do you like those square shapes? Do you like more um, circular shapes, things along those lines? And this bottom one, okay, don't tell people at the Master Gardener program, but any rain garden's better than no rain garden. <laughs> Even if it's um, something that just holds the water for a while, that's gonna help get some of that water perked down back into the aquifer. Oh, thank you for putting that in there. Thank you. Questions, comments? Okay. So this is just an example of um, how you might slope your rain garden down. So there are three, what we kind of think of as zones in a rain garden. At the bottom, that place where we put the plants that are okay to have their feet really, really wet for up to about 24 hours or so. The plants in the middle part there are plants that are okay getting their feet wet quite, a, quite frequently, but not so much standing water. And then around the buffer, that's whatever kind of planting you have elsewhere in your yard that you'd like to blend into, or just whatever kind of more generic plants you might enjoy. Make sense? So then you start digging. Um, many people use a garden hose to lay out a new garden bed. Some people use spray paint, which is always kind of fun. I kind of make a mess with spray paint, but I do kind of have fun with it. Um, and then, you know, lay out the bed in a way that you think is going to look good in your yard. Um, then you make sure that you can get your water there. So whether it's a dry creek bed that your gutters go in, that your downspouts empty into, or that comes off the edge of your patio, or if it's those tight lines that you connect your downspouts directly and run them underground in. But make sure that you have a way for the water to get there. And then if we happen to have a real goalie washer, as my mom used to call them, um, and it's going to overflow, make sure you know where that overflow is going to go and that you're creating it in a way that you can direct that, um, that periodic overflow either into your existing storm drains or across a lawn or something along those lines. And then 
you've decided how big it needs, how deep it needs to be based on how well it drains. So you dig it down that far, slope the sides, pack those up and flatten the bottom. And we are good to go. The soil, we've talked a little bit about that already. If you have really bad soil in there, you can dig down further and put in rain garden soil and then it will drain a whole lot better. If you have some mostly pretty good soil, but it could use some improvement, then you can just mix in either some straight compost or the rain garden mix, which is the compost and sand, and that will improve the drainage of moderately good soil. If you happen to have really good soil, you can just maybe throw in a little bit of compost to make sure it's draining really well and good. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh oh, uh oh, got ahead of myself there. So we talked already a little bit about the three zones. So there's the bottom where things get really, really wet. Then there are the ones up the middle where they're okay being wet periodically. And then on the top that are pretty typical plants that you would see in any garden. And depending on how you plant them, they could just all blend together so that it looks like that one unified garden. And then you lay it out just like you would lay out any other garden. I look at these pictures and I think, man, I would love to learn to lay out a garden like that. <laughs> I'm afraid that mine are a little bit more ad hoc. So don't worry about being formal in your design of it. But again, your colors and textures are just things that you appreciate and like in your landscape or go with the landscape that you already have. And we'll talk a little bit more about sun and shade and what kind of plants go where. In the end, it's just another garden that has a few special characteristics. So this is the part everybody really likes. What are the plants that go in there? What can I stick in that garden to look good? There are, um, in that rain garden handbook, there are quite a lot of plants that are listed in the rain garden handbook. Um, there are also other lists of rain garden plants online. I believe the city of Seattle has a really great list. Um, so there's quite a number of those you can get. Um, so I just put a few examples out here so that you can get an idea for the different kinds of colors and textures that you can have in a rain garden. So these are plants that are okay to have their toes wet for 24 hours at a time without any problem. And I have to say that orange sedge is just a favorite of mine. I use it a lot in my yard because I think it is so lovely. Um, the native irises, we all know those, you can't kill those no matter what you do to them. Crimson flag, crimson flag is one that I think is a little bit underused. It's a native and it will spread slowly but nicely. Um, a number of the sedges do really, really well down in the base of that garden. They're fine getting wet for quite some time, as well as some of the other black grasses. In this case, the blue fescue and blue oat grass are here for those blue tones. Um, Joe Pie, now of course, the regular Joe Pie gets really, really tall. He can get, you know, six feet tall, but there are some dwarf ones that stay closer to maybe about three feet that would go well in the bottom as well. And a sword fern, there isn't any place in the Northwest where you cannot put a sword fern, I will swear. So here we have it in the very bottom of a rain garden where it's going to get absolutely soaked. And on the other hand, I've had it on dry, sandy, Southwest facing banks and never watered it and it does fine. So to me, the sword ferns are just kind of the workhorse of a Pacific Northwest garden. You can use them still in any place. And then here's some ideas of plants you can put in the shade in the very bottom. Um, in the shade, we start getting more into the ferns. There are a lot of ferns that you can use. Um, lady fern and ostrich fern are a couple of them that just have that really pretty chartreuse that's so nice in the shade. They're just so, so brilliant. Um, viburnums, um, if you want something that's more of a shrub, a, a viburnum makes a really good focal point in the shade in, the bottom of a rain garden, some of the lobelias and rushes. Then as you start up the sides of the rain garden, um, some of the things that do really well getting wet, getting very wet periodically, but then draining pretty quickly. Um, red twig dogwoods, which I think are so glorious and it's too bad the deer think so too, because 
I just can't use them because we have so many deer. Um, so I hope you can use them for me if you don't have deer. The um, Coreopsis, the tall tick seed, is just um, a really, really bright, lovely plant that will grow depending on which variation you have. Grows a couple feet high and blooms all summer long. If you just take the shears to it and give it a cut back once in a while, give it a haircut. Um, switch grass, bottle grass. So again, some of the grasses going up the side. Um, Penstemons come in so many colors and variations too. This one happens to have the very red leaves with the white that have a little bit of red around the edges. And again, that old Joe Pye weed, you can stick him up there too. And then going into the shade, if you're in the shade going up the sides, you like those things that brighten it up a little bit. The Boneras are absolutely gorgeous. They um, shine really silver in the shade and like those a lot as well. Bears breeches, I like saying it as much as anything else, but um, they're natives and require virtually no work around here at all. Bleeding hearts are interesting. They, um, they're gorgeous in the spring, but then they'll absolutely disappear for the rest of the summer. But if you have other perennials around the edges, that works out really well because they're out and blooming before the other perennials are really even poking their noses up. And by the time they die back, your other perennials are up. And so you still don't have an open base. Um, Oregon grape, the Mahonia, looks really nice on the, um, in the shady areas. And some of the ferns again, go up really nicely on the sides. And then when you get up onto the top part, you know, again, just about anything will do. Um, so depending on what you've got going down the sides there, you can bring your um, coreopsis on up the sides. Um, camas is a native that I think is really underused around here, the camas or camasia. Um, I always kind of like that we have, yeah, it's really pretty. It's a lovely, lovely thing. Um, Kanik is one that I like a lot. And there's an interesting thing about Kanik. I've had a lot of people ask me, why is my Kanik name black? And my question is always, do you water it? And the answer is always yes. And then my answer is always, but don't do that. Um, so if you want a ground cover for really, really dry, that's a native, Kanik Kanik is really hard to beat. It just requires no work whatsoever. So those are some ideas for the sun where you would not have to water them on the edges of your garden. And then these are some in the shade around that you can put around the edges go really well. Salal, again, really slow growing, beautiful, bright, bright green in the springtime. Um, if you'd like something a little taller, it's hard to beat a vine maple. You know, we, we pay a lot of money for the Japanese maples, but our, our native vine maples are absolutely beautiful as well. And those darn red twig dogwoods that are deer candy again. Um, some of the hardy fuchsias, epimedium. Epimedium is one that I think is underused as well. It goes in the shade. It never needs to be watered and it just sort of slowly spread to make a really nice ground cover. So lots and lots of choices. How do you maintain a rain garden once you've got it built? And the answer is like any other garden. <laughs> when things are getting a little bit too big, you snip their noses off. And when the weeds start growing, you pull them out. Um, I will say one thing that because the soil in rain, rain gardens tends to have a lot of compost, um, the weeds are as happy as your plants. And so you have to keep a careful eye on them until your plants have filled in enough that they basically keep the weeds out. Um, so yeah, you want to put a little bit of mulch in there to make sure it's doing okay and make sure that your water inlet and your overflow stay clear so the water can move through it if it needs to. And like any other garden, if you got a plant in the wrong place and he's not happy, you got to do something different and move them around. Um, like any other garden that you put in, the new plantings need watered quite a bit for the first year or two while they're getting themselves established. And for that, you wanna water them really deeply. So water them one couple of times a week for half an hour to 45 minutes, get that really deep watering going so the roots grow really long and they will do well for you. But it doesn't really need any, any special care. It would be the same care as any other garden other than making sure that that inlet and outlet remain pretty clear of debris and dirt. 
So botline is, it's just another garden. It's got a few special features, but somebody's rose garden would have some special features too. So just a little different way of building a garden. Um, you want the right plant in the right place always. And I like this, but I like thinking of it as a working garden. So very much like vegetable garden is a working garden. You put stuff in and you get stuff out and it does things for you. This one also does things for you. It filters that water for you. It helps with drainage on your property and it certainly keeps those bee coho alive. You can either make something that is right out in the middle of your yard all by itself and a real feature, or you can blend him into your garden and no one will even know he's there. Can build in the center shade, needs well draining soil, but you can work on that if you don't have it. And remember that any rain garden is better than no rain garden. Thoughts, questions, comments? Any questions, folks? You're welcome to enter in the chat box or unmute yourself. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the whole concept of the rain garden is absolutely wonderful. And um, like how you were saying, um, how beautiful of a landscaping that you can create it. Mm -hmm. yep. um, it's not what I expected. And oh, it's, good. <laughs> yeah, that's so wonderful. Good. So, what about you know, other people? Yeah. yeah what were the expectations? I think other people that I've spoken to, a lot of people think that it has to be ornamental grasses for some reason. I'm not sure where that idea came from. It's one that floats around a lot. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Oh, Jennifer asked, what if gutters are close to the house and already drain well? Well, even if it already drains well, and depending on where it goes, you can still put the rain garden in and filter that water. So if you're in the city and it goes directly into a storm sewer and you'd rather not be taking that untreated water directly into the storm sewer, you can still divert it into a rain garden and filter that water. And there are pollutants that come off of the shingles on our roofs as well. And so filtering those out is a good thing. Um, an un, oops, if I can go back to the slideshow, a white blooming plant sunny zone three. Let's see what we can, what we can find here. Every once in a while, my uh, machine just is not happy. Oh, this guy, I believe that's a mock orange, if I recall correctly. I think it is a mock orange. A mock orange and it's, yes. and it's white. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's adorable. <laughs> you know, like an orange tree. <laughs> yeah. It's I like think that's what it is. I wouldn't <laughs> stare to it. Uh, I should actually check that picture, shouldn't I? Thank you for that. Rain um, curtains around tree roots. Um, the, you know, the only, that's an interesting question. I've not heard that question. So let's ponder that a bit. Um, trees that shouldn't have a rain garden around it. I would think that any tree that's a native would be okay with having a rain garden around it. Um, but if you have a tree, that, I'm trying to think of what kind of, is kind of a tree. A pine might be a good example. Some of the pines like being really dry. And so if you have a tree that likes being really dry, you probably would want to keep the rain garden as far from it as possible. But most of the trees that we have, even ornamentals that are non-natives, benefit from really deep watering. And so it should be fine. And in fact, we built one. So I should tell you a little bit about the program that Pierce County has to build um, rain gardens. 
So the Pierce Conservation District has a program where they will, um, in effect, subsidize the cost of building a rain garden. You can get a hold of them and get on the list, and they will come out and do all the mathematical work for you on um, how large your rain garden needs to be based on what you're trying to drain and all of that. And then they have the master gardeners come out and work with you on what shape you'd like it to be, um, what kind of plants do you like, and then we work, we, we create a planting plan along with you um, that includes plants that you particularly like. You get the, the um, uh, actual garden dug and then you're able to get plants at wholesale through the Pierce Conservation District so that you can create that, that rain garden and start benefiting things and pay a little bit less to do it. They also have a program in the city of Tacoma proper that will sometimes subsidize those even a little bit more than just um, allowing the, um, providing that wholesale price for the plants and the master gardeners to come out and do that. So that's through the Pierce Conservation District in, um, in coordination with the Pierce County Master Gardeners. So you can ask the Master Gardeners or the Pierce County Conservation District about that. Um, and Marlene has my contact information. So if you would like more information about that, you can go through her to get to me and we can hook you up. Um, Pussy Willow would be a great choice actually because Pussy Willows love having their feet wet periodically. So a Pussy Willow would be a really good choice. Mm. But it would. And pretty. Yeah, they are pretty, aren't they? And this time of year, they're just, it, you know, it's so nice to see those things that come out so early in the spring, isn't it? They're kind of heartwarming. Every year I say, no, I'm not going to do primroses. I do primroses every year. And then every year I see the primroses and there they go. <laughs> 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 Got to have those yeah. harbingers of spring, don't we? <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. It's been so delightful seeing also the cherry blossoms. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, it's like, been beautiful. Yeah, We're really beautiful. And have some winter. sunshine. Yeah, yes. actual sunshine. And we haven't had wind that tends to blow all the tree blossoms away a day or two after they open. So that's nice too. <laughs> yeah, we get to yeah. enjoy them a little bit longer than normal. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Any more questions? Will we have our wonderful... Uh, presenter here, WSU Master Gardener, Patricia Peterson. Let me check Facebook Live here. See okay. if there's any questions there. Okay, I don't see any there, but um, let's go ahead and hop off Facebook Live and we can open up the Zoom call. So um, say goodbye to all of our Facebook Live friends. <laughs>